I just want to say it's my pleasure this evening to introduce you to Dr. Robert and Rosalie Lawrence. And I've known Robert and Rosalie for over six years now and have connected with them a, a number of occasions. It, you'll have to wake her up again. <laughs> um, due to our shared interest in, in conservation. Um, Robert and Rosalie have their own bush care business and a long association with the Native Orchid Society of South Australia. And they've been instrumental in the setting up of the Citizen Science Project for Wild Orchid Watch. And tonight they're here to talk to us about native orchids. Please welcome Robert and Rosalie. Well, thank you very much uh, for your introduction and, and the privilege of speaking to you. It's been a privilege being at the AGM tonight and hearing all the fabulous work that's been happening. Uh, so, yeah, that's my title slide. Um, the next slide shows you just what I hope to talk about tonight. Most of it is about orchids as survivors, a bit about their ecology, based on a short video that uh, has been produced in Western Australia. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, our citizen science work and a little bit about bush care and how that helps with um, creating habitat for orchids. And I'll be talking particularly about what the Native Orchid Society of South Australia is doing. Earth's most ubiquitous life forms tend to be generalists, species whose individuals can adapt to eating just about anything, anywhere. But the flowering plant family known as orchids have gained a global presence by being specialists, with each species customized to a very specific habitat. And behind orchids' wild variety of looks and behaviors are the same few stingy strategies. For one, while other flowering plants send their seeds off with a supply of victuals to get them growing, orchids don't. Instead, their seedlings must trick fungi into feeding them until they're old enough to photosynthesize their own food. At that point, some species start giving back, but others hoodwink their fungal partners into lifelong one-way relationships. In fact, several are so dedicated to mooching that they don't even have the ability to produce their own sugar. And many orchids also cheat their pollinators. While most flowers offer snacks to the critters who transfer their pollen, orchids have a rich array of disguises that make them look or smell like the pollinator's potential mates or their favorite sugar-filled flowers. For example, Australian hammer orchids look and smell like flightless female wasps. But when a male tries to carry her off to mate, he catapults instead into the flower's sex organs, sometimes picking up a sticky packet of pollen. Then there's the orchid's choice of real estate. Instead of setting down roots in a patch of rich soil, and then having to waste energy competing with other plants for light and nutrients, most orchids settle in inhospitable, low-rent locations like bare bedrock, soggy bogs, or the branches of trees. Orchids have customized these miserly habits, mooching off of fungi, cheating pollinators, and choosing cheap real estate, to habitats ranging from sub-Antarctic islands to tropical rainforests. And in the process, they've blossomed into an astounding 25,000 species, most of which are specialized to live in only one particular place with its particular conditions. And their wild variety and exotic looks have not escaped our notice. During the so-called orchid delirium in 19th century England, rich aristocrats sent orchid hunters off to scour the tropics for rare, valuable finds. The hunters even sometimes torched or raised the forest behind them in a quest for exclusivity. Today, it's illegal to collect or trade wild orchids, but tens of thousands of flowers are sold on the black market each year, some for tens of thousands of dollars. And while orchid hunters themselves no longer chop down whole forests, vast swaths of prime orchid habitat are lost to deforestation each year, putting thousands of orchid species at risk of extinction. And yet, orchids' diverse splendor may actually help save them, thanks to the devotion of a global network of orchid files. In 2010, police in England stood guard around the clock to protect the country's last wild lady slipper orchid from thieves. And in Ecuador, home to some of the highest densities of orchids in the world, conservationists established rainforest reserves to save the remarkable looking Dracula orchids. Meanwhile, Australian citizens are building fences to protect threatened spider orchids from grazing rabbits and kangaroos. And scientists in the US are breeding rare cigar orchids in the lab and planting them in their native habitat in South Florida. All to save a bunch of plants that lie, cheat, steal, and ooh, that one's pretty. Hey, Emily here. 
Thanks to Curtin University and the University of Western Australia for sponsoring this video. Also, special thanks to Kingsley Dixon and the rest of the folks in the ORCID Specialist Group of the IUCN's Species Survival Commission for sharing their expertise with us. The Specialist Group is dedicated to helping ORCID files around the world learn more about Earth's most diverse plant family in order to protect and restore ORCIDs and their habitats. Yeah, so that's really good to see that the acknowledgement that uh, this is a really great video that they've put together and it's, it's good to take it through to the end. Okay, so basically I, I want to go through those different kinds of features that were just talked about. So basically the, the stingy nature of orchids is, is sort of the theme of those, uh, of those different features, so we move on. Um, yeah, so this is an example of the, the tiny seed. So that's, that's my finger with some um, seeds of Pterostylus newtons on it from, from a freshly opened um, capsule. So, I don't know, what hundred, hundreds of seeds just in that little space. So all could send their children out without any food for, for lunch. They've got to fend for themselves and find a, um, a fungi or have a fungi find them at the right spot and, and to germinate them. Um, so we have some examples of um, orchids that depend entirely on fungi. So next one. So these are potato orchids, Gastrodia, uh, which occur in Kaipo Forest, for example, and further south. And they just come straight out of the ground uh, from a large tuber and they, they don't photosynthesize at all. Um, another species that are the hyacinth orchids. Some of them have green, some, some don't, but essentially they are completely reliant on fungi. Um, these tend to occur uh, under the stringy, stringy bark trees, so that you have an example there in the background. Um, so either uh, Baxteri or uh, Ovata, sorry, not Ovata, um, Obliqua, um, tend to be the, the host trees. So there's an uh, example of some of their flowers. They can have pink ones on... Um, on green or red stems, or, and white ones on green and red stems, so uh, the, the colour doesn't affect their, their growth at all. Uh, another orchid is the uh, one of the donkey orchids, the short-leaf donkey orchid, uh, Diurus brevifolia, and you can see in the picture on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, yes, the um, the tiny leaves at the bottom are not big enough to to feed a flower of that size, so basically it's depending on fungi for most of its uh, for most of its um, nutrition. Uh, we have a few examples of uh, different ways of cheating pollinators. Uh, this is one example with the Diurus orientis uh, mimicking uh, Platylobium obtuse angulum. So they both have similar coloured flowers, similar shape. The orchid flowers are, are bigger and often a bit more colourful, so a bit more tempting for a bee uh, hovering around to, to sort of visit one of them on, by mistake. Um, uh, the king spider orchid is pollinated like those um, hammer orchids that we saw in the video, where a male wasp will land on the labellum, and the, the picture on the right shows a labellum that's been damaged by a wasp that's landed on it and tried to take it away. And it, it's broken the little hinge, so the, the labellum sort of wobbles in the, in the wind normally. Uh, and so sometimes people find these with the, with the labellum down there and think, oh, I've found a new species or something. But uh, it's a really good indicator that there, um, that there are pollinating wasps around when you see that uh, damaged. Of course, it's much better when you can see the, the seed pods starting to form. <laughs> that's an even better indicator. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, they mentioned the harsh habitat, so hang on to your seats, we go into this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is on a cliff top, you can see there's a, a little pocket of soil there that's enough to produce, a, to, to support a few little sedges, Lepidosperma, uh, but the, um, so you can see there's a little plant there, they have a little rosette of leaves at the bases, so there's a few in there that um, Bevan's uh, trying to photograph. 
and this this is um, a flower. We we generally go monitoring them when the the leaves are out because they're easy to find. By the time the flowers up, the leaves are shriveled and and, it, and you can't count them. Uh, so quite a pretty little flower. So these are, are either Pterostylus bacillus or a subspecies or related species to that. Uh, the other, another habitat that was mentioned was swamps. So these um, spiranthes, uh, ladies' tresses, orchids, grow in, in wet uh, habitats. You need your rubber boots on to, to go and visit these habitats. So, so these flower in the middle of summer, were one of the few flowering, few orchids that flower in February, January, February. We don't have any in South Australia that grow on trees, but um, we were privileged to be shown some in Tasmania. Um, uh, soon after we landed on the ferry, we were, within an hour of arriving in Tasmania, we were, we were uh, driven to this site to see uh, just about every plant has been labelled with a pink tag, so you can see some off in the distance. Mm -hmm. And so they, they just, their roots just grow on those little twigs and that uh, they get enough moisture f uh, to survive on that. So yeah, we don't have any um, epiphytic orchids in South Australia at all. Um, the video I didn't mention this, but there's, there's some other strategies that orchids have to um, to conserve their resources. Um, one of them, as I mentioned before, that uh, the leaves will wither uh, before the flower comes up. So particularly for flowers that's um, come out in uh, late spring, or the, when it's already dry, well, they don't want to have their leaves out transpiring, so they, they just rely on stored energy in the tuber to, to flower. So, so there's a, quite a few orchids where you find where, where the leaf is um, shriveled by the time the flower is up. Depends sometimes on the season. Um, at the other end of the season, we have these um, fringed hair orchids, and they will come straight out of the ground with, with no leaf in, in um, March or April. And they are flowering early enough to catch the insect activity. So you know that, that ants tend to swarm at a certain time. You know, there will be a certain trigger of um, you know, increase in humidity before a rain event and they will all come out. So this is actually one of the few orchids that's pollinated by an ant, but it's still the same um, a, a sexual deception where it imitates the fragments put out by a, um, by a female ant. Um, yeah, this, this ant is one that I'm allergic to. <laughs> Found out the hard way. Um, yes, it's, it's like a hopping ant, but just a little bit smaller. Oh, I'm so, sorry, just, just go back one. So the leaves are quite distinctive, uh, with with um, five red veins on them, and they um, they appear after the first rains, um, when the soil's moistened up, and they grow in very sandy soils, so they they do need that moisture, and people find them and think, oh, I'll keep, I'll go back and, and get, and they'll see what the flower looks like, and of course, the the leaves will will be gone because the flower will, will come next year uh, by the time you see those leaves. Okay. Um, fire orchids have been mentioned before. Uh, so this, this one was uh, at Reeves Plains and it's, um, it wasn't after fire. And, and sometimes you get a, a, a patch of a presumably a clone where they, they all flower every year at, at that in amongst that particular group that they're prone to flower. Um, these are just some, um, some newly emerged leaves showing that they, they come up with those bright purple spots which really make it easy to identify. Uh, the next one, I've commonly seen lots of leaves and they can go, you know, people have said, oh, I've seen them on my property for 40 years and they've never flowered. And then if, if you do have a, a fire event, well, you, you'll get like this, uh, just about every plant will, 
wool flower. Um, um, this one was taken a few weeks ago. Uh, this uh, plant I, I've, is at a site where I've been working for uh, almost a decade, I guess, and we watched these plants grow from just a, a narrow leaf, and um, this was the first year I've actually seen them flowering. So this, this was at uh, 11 a.m., and they just starting to open, and I was thinking before that they were Thelemitra uh, bracteata, but as soon as I saw that starting to open, I thought, oh no, this is one of those um, neuter group, the, the larger sun orchids. So an hour later, that same plant was, was fully out. And, uh, so that's um, Thelemitra megcalypta, it's one with a, um, a green leaf and a, a red base. Uh, but the, the point I'm making about this is they, they only flower for that peak time in the middle of the day when the insects are most active and they don't risk losing moisture by having their flower open all the time. So they, they close up for, for most of the time. Just, and so they can be open for several uh, days and, or even a couple of weeks. Sometimes the, you know, the flowers work their way up the stem and they have plenty of opportunity to attract insects uh, for pollinating. And this year, I think most of those on that stem up, uh, have produced uh, fruit that will set seeds. Uh, another strategy that is um, camouflage. So, we, next one is this is um, uh, one of the leaf orchids, Prasophyllum alatum, and no, and so this this is the, um, a close picture of one of them. They're, they're quite hard to find. Uh, um, Rosalie wanted to to photograph one of these, and and I said, oh, there's one, <laughs> and so she. She was able to probably take better photos than I did. Um, so the next one uh, shows there's, there's actually three of those. So this one in the middle is how they normally appear, dark green with a red base. But these two uh, came up black. And then they match the appearance of Hachia rostrata. Uh, there were lots of these. Um, burnt sticks, so trying to spot the orchids amongst the, the, um, the burnt sticks was challenging. And uh, we learnt that this um, uh, level of burning, that's quite an intense fire because you know, the, a hakea bush that was like this in size, to actually have the, you know, the, almost the, all of the top of the plant vaporised in the fire, that was, that was a very hot fire. There was no leaves left on the top of the trees. So, you know, no scorched leaves. It was all, it was all very badly burnt. Oh, this is this is the Australia Day fire at um, at uh, Mount Bold Reservoir. Um, yeah, the the length of time that orchids live is an interesting question. Uh, the next one, the um, the copper beardy. It's a rare orchid. Like there's about twenty left or something, and they. Because they're so rare, every plant has, is, is monitored with a numbered tag. And what they found was that they, they came up as a full flower and they lived for two years, and that, like they had one in 50 or something that survived into the third year, and then they're, they're gone. So um, nobody has seen a leaf without a flower. So either they're really difficult to find, or they they grow as a tuber completely from a fungi and when they're ready to emerge with a flower they pop up, they use up all their energy in those two years and then they're, they're done for. Uh, and so the, the more local species, um, um, you've probably all seen Calicylus robertsonii, um, we don't know how long they live. Um, they could be similar, they could just last for one or two years as well. And this is why we need a bit more observations, a bit more science. People actually taking care to actually look at the same orchids and see what's happening. Um, so these, you, it's unusual to find a leaf of these by themselves as well. Sometimes early in the season you may manage to find one, but generally the, by the, soon after the leaf appears, the flower pops up and, and does its bit. 
So yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd like more information about these. Um, another one that's possibly short-lived is um, Diurus pardina. Um, this, I've seen them at uh, Stonyfield and I've only ever seen them for two years as well. So we, we don't know whether they are short-lived and so then you're thinking we well, need constant changes or a, a disturbance regime. Yeah, so that we can have new seedlings constantly being um, germinating and, and growing into adult plants. So this is a bit local. Uh, from Moores Road, uh, I'm the yellow dots in here are locations of um, Diurus pardina. Uh, and you can see they're basically restricted to the fire breaks. The, the green lines show the tracks where we walked. This was back in 2015 when we did those, um, those tours. And, um, and the purple dots are the uh, fire orchids. And so you can see that there are uh, populations of, of fire orchids which are not, um, don't match the, where the fire breaks are. So they're, they're obviously there before the roads and the fire breaks and, they, and they're still there afterwards. So they've got a much longer longevity and so the, the kind of disturbance they need uh, is a lot less frequent. Obviously fires would be the, their main opportunity for, um, for dispersal and often when the, the orchids are flowering after fire are often about the only thing flowering. So any insect coming along, that's all they've got to try is, is going from orchid to orchid. Um, sometimes there'll be a lot of um, milkmaids tend to be one of the main survivors of fire and, and that, that gives the insects at least something to for some nutrition because or orchids don't like feeding their pollinators. And so even some don't have um, much in the way of uh, fragrance. Um, these sun orchids that I showed before, some of them do have fragrance as well to, to help attract insects. So yes, yeah, citizen science. Citizen science is one of our key interests. Then, you know, to, to understand more about their habitat, we need people out collecting data. So back in 2011, um, I worked on this. Book as a, it was a family project, um, and at the same time, Rosalie was working with with a group to produce a disc of all the orchids of South Australia. So mine has um, uh, 50 common or the most common orchids of South Australia, plus some other plants, the, the common lilies, and some iris weeds, which people look at and think, "Oh, this is an orchid." You know, things like um, Thread iris is probably one of the most common things people assume is an orchid because it's a pretty little flower and they think that that's what they've found. So, so back in 2011, or no, back, in, yeah, a bit later, 2013, we came across this um, Go Orchids website and, um, and the Go Botany website, which was produced by the New England Wildflower Society. In America, yes, that, that New England, not the, not the New South Wales one. Um, and I was a bit naughty because I put up a, a location of one of our most common weeds, so the cat's ear, the rough cat's ear. I put a location on that just to see whether it worked. And, and I got an email a, a bit later saying, oh, we, we're going to upgrade our system. Um, please download your data and you can upload it again. And I thought, oh, an email. I can contact someone. <laughs> and so I, I contacted them and said, oh, I was interested. Could we do something similar? So we ended up putting in a grant to the Australian Orchid Foundation and, and got $5,000 sort of seed grant to try and do something, um, uh, which sort of didn't really work. <laughs> but we, we learned some things in the process. So uh, then in... Um, 2016 there was a, a grant scheme available for grants up to half a million dollars and I thought oh this is a good way to get things off the ground quickly and so we put in an application 
that was an, um, an exercise because the grants were announced sort of mid-December and I don't know if you know university life, but it's pretty hard contacting people in December. And the deadline was, I think, the 20th of February? 17th. 17th of February. So on the 10th of February, we managed to meet with people in the terrestrial research, terrestrial ecosystems research network at the University of Adelaide uh, to talk about the possibility of them dropping everything and applying for a grant, um, which they did. Um, and so we had the task of pruning his... Oh, uh, Ben Sparrow did most, most of the work there, uh, obviously knew how to do this, and he said, oh, I've got this document, it's uh, 6,000 characters, it needs to be 4,000 to, to fit on the, the website, so can you shorten this? Oh, sure, no problem, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the two of us did that. You know, any... Uh, any um, any phrase which was descriptive, we just edited those, those out, and you know, citizen science became CS, you know, those sort, sorts of things. Uh, so, and we weren't successful uh, when they announced the grants initially, but then they, there was so much interest in the grants, they decided to fund the second round. So we scraped in <laughs> to do that. So, so we got this, this grant to set up the, the website, and although our initial plan was to go with the Go Botany, Go Orchid sort of approach, they, the developers realised that iNaturalist provided the exact, exactly what we needed for a platform without doing a lot of the work, because they already had the system there. They already had the links to the government databases and um, the approval processes so, and the artificial intelligence. So we we were able to develop some new strategies uh, which they didn't have time to do. So we were able to do what our naturalist wanted to do but didn't have the, the computing resources to, to do. Um, Orchids are unique and curious plants. There are over 1,800 species of native orchids in Australia. They range from small delicate flowers in the undergrowth of temperate woodlands to large showy epiphytes in the rainforest canopy. And they represent a significant proportion of Australia's rare and threatened flora. Scientists believe that orchids are an indicator of ecosystem change, yet many things about them remain unknown. As part of Inspiring Australia's Citizen Science Program, scientists from the University of Adelaide, together with native orchid enthusiasts, are developing Wild Orchid Watch. Let's hear why the experts are excited about this new initiative. Wild Orchid Watch represents a unique opportunity to bring together information collected by keen citizen scientists who spend a lot of time in the field making useful observations into a centralised system with appropriate and informed data and be able to share that across the whole country but also with scientists who need to know that information. We still don't know enough about native orchids to understand their distribution and flowering patterns and we know even less about how these are changing. We're developing the Wild Orchid Watch app, which citizen scientists will use to collect native orchid observations. For each of these observations, the app will prompt users to take a set of photos, and we'll also ask them a few questions on the local environment in which the native orchid was sighted. The app also makes use of the phone's location awareness to record where sightings occur. This extra information enriches the sighting and means that the context of the sighting can be better understood. Wild Orchid Watch will make this information available for researchers Scientists can make use of every orchid observation uploaded on the WOW app for common and rare species. One of the most important and valuable contributions from my perspective as a taxonomist is that those observations will help us understand where species that might be very rare or even as yet undiscovered exist in the wild. And when we can find those populations or those plants that might be surviving that allows us to enact on that information and improve the protection of them, but also to get a better understanding of the diversity of orchids remaining in our natural environment.
So it's a wonderful repository of information that can be used in a whole range of ways. Over the years, many thousands of historical sightings have been collected by local orchid enthusiast groups throughout Australia. Wild Orchid Watch will act as a space for collecting these historical sightings, allowing them to be uploaded, curated and preserved. They will give us reliable information to track change in orchids using non-destructive methods. The Wild Orchid Watch app is now being validated and will be ready for national rollout in early 2020. Use the Wild Orchid Watch app to record your orchid sightings, to share with other orchid enthusiasts and to have your IDs confirmed. Your data is important to us and it will be used in scientific research. Just download the Wild Orchid Watch app and head out to your favourite orchid spotting site. Get involved and help unlock the mysteries of Australian native orchids and together we can make a difference. Remember that orchids grow in highly sensitive environments, so please stay on the track or path, tread carefully, and take only photos home with you. Yes. So, um, as you're probably aware, that was most of the filming was done on site at um, Moores Road, at the top end of Morialka. Um, of course, we really appreciate the support from the State Herbarium for this project. Even back when we were doing the, the disc that Rosalie worked on, uh, they were very supportive and we spent quite a few hours with them uh, with their help to, to improve this, the, uh, the documents. So they've, they've always been behind this, this project which has been really wonderful. Um, yes, yeah, so I've just listed a few advantages of, of the, that, the whole plat platform. So Wild Orchid Watch sort of sits as a project within iNaturalist. So you can actually go into iNaturalist and look up each observation and, and see the, the details. Uh, so the, the advantages, uh, the, we, if you load up an observation using the phone app, it automatically obscures the location, uh, which, which is really important for security uh, to prevent poaching. So when it shows up on a map, it it's show, just shows a large quad bat of um, What's it? 20 kilometre sides, or depends a little bit on how big the one degree is. Um, and, um, but if you, you can do an observation through iNaturalist and uh, put it onto the project, but it won't be automatically obscured. You have to actually manually obscure it if you do that. If, yeah, sometimes it's not necessary if you're, if you're loading the location of a um, Mayfly, for example, that you could do that fully safely without anyone wanting to dig it up. Um, so, yeah, the adventure, the ease of recording, you just have to get your phone out, take a picture and, and up, upload and answer a few questions. But there is a, a, um, a detailed mode, so you can turn that off and just answer about six questions, and that can be an, off, an easy way to get started and just say, if you don't want to count them, you just say uh, partial count and just say one, and at least it puts it on. So if you find a, a different orchid to what you've seen before, it's really worth doing a wild orchid watch uh, record so that we've got some record of, of its habitat. Um, so having it all in one place means that different people can have a look at what orchids are, are around, um, and so it's a good way of learning about orchids and, and about uh, about other uh, aspects of nature, so you know the insects and spiders and fungi, all sorts of organisms are, are up on iNaturalist, and um, bioblitz are really good for, for getting to see some of that variety that's that's around the local areas. Um, the, the, there's no need to decide which app to go to. If you find an insect, a flower, you just put everything on iNaturalist. You don't have to worry about it. Um, Fungi Map used to have their own uh, website and, and app, and they <coughs> transferred everything onto iNaturalist because it was a more convenient platform to, to do that from. Um, and it does go straight into the, the databases. So the Biological Databases of South Australia has uh, gets uploads from this, and then it, it also goes onto the Atlas of Living Australia. And it is certainly useful for research. Uh, Rosalie's had a contact from a PhD student who's been using the data to, to find uh, examples. So 
and and of course it's really important for management. If people don't know that there's an orchid in a site, then then they can just clear it or um, build something on it or put tracks. And, um, yes, if they don't, if they don't know, then then they you can't sort of avoid it. So it's it's really important for management information. Uh, changing subject to to uh, bush care. Um, this, this is an example in Flagstaff Hill where a couple of years ago we cut down some pine trees and all those little white dots in this picture, there's one or two hundred, they're, they're actually Thelmitra rubra that have um, enjoyed that extra light and space uh, just, by, just by removing the canopy of the weeds uh, over them. But of course, it, the grass in this area is mainly uh, perennial velt grass, so it also uh, enjoys that same disturbance. Um, so at least there are strategies for controlling velt grass. You can wait for the orchids to, to die off, and you can uh, spray them with a um, with a either a grass specific or or a non-selective herbicide. It, if it's safe to do so, um, depending on what else is there. It also has some um, uh, Oxalis purpurea growing there, so we've had to actually carefully dab leaves to try and reduce that and to, uh, to increase that habitat. But you know, how long will that habitat be there that will be suitable before other things come, come in? It might be five, it might be ten years, and, and then that, that habitat will be crowded out by other uh, more long-term plans. Um, this shows at that park um, just the change that's happened. Um, so you, the, the dots, the different colour symbols are different kinds of orchids. Uh, so um, this picture shows that there was a, a pine forest there and this, these two triangles in there were, were all pine forest. And so and it's a wonderful habitat for orchids. And what we did there, we, when we got there, uh, the pine forest was full of bone seed from about this high to, to this high. And we, um, we used brush cutters with blades and, and just cut it. At the time, most people were doing cut and swap, which was really slow. Uh, but we just, um, we just brush cut and we didn't have any problem with regrowth. Um, so it yeah, saves a lot of time doing it that way. Um, so yeah, the main regrowth is. Um, um, I'll just go back to that one. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, is is from the seeding. So that that hasn't been a big problem. So that little cluster that I showed in that picture was just in here. Uh, so that it wasn't evident. So so there's a. Um, a row of pines along here that I think SA Water planted because they had this view that they could make money from them. Um, there's a, a power line that runs along this, this edge here, so um, yeah, that, uh, they're a bit nervous about the pine trees next to the, to the power lines. All right, yes, so this, the next picture is from about here. Uh, between those pine forests, and just by controlling the weedy grasses, the, the native grasses, mainly spear grasses, some um, wallaby grasses, have filled in that space just by doing some weed control. And there are thelemitras that are um, multiplying in this, um, in the habitat in between those um, tussocks of, of native grasses. Um, we found these seedlings um, this year, and when we found them, we, we didn't know what they were. But then we found this, where we had uh, weeded around uh, an old Adenanthus terminana, terminalis, um, I think they're called gland plant or something like that. Um, we had sprayed out the weedy pentamerus and perennial velt grass, and all these seedlings came up in that gap around them. So just by doing the, the weeding has actually generated seedlings 
are, which we'd, we'd never seen seedlings of it before. So it was just the right conditions, the, the right timing to, to get rid of the grasses before. Um, this little yellow thing here is significant, the, the cat's ears. They, again, they love that same disturbance. So whenever you're creating habitat, you're also creating habitat for weeds. And so they need to be managed. Uh, the next one is also a, um, one of those sites where we sprayed out the weeds. And these are actually a species of triglocken. As you might know triglocken as water ribbons. They have a, a, uh, a wide flat leaf and they grow, grow in water. And they're quite, you know, with the flowering stems can be quite tall. But these are just little plants like this. So these are the only ones I've ever seen at the park, and that's in an area where we'd sprayed out the weeds. So if weeding does create habitat, again, there's a, the flat weeds with the little bud there. So yeah, they, that constant tension between um, those emerging weeds filling in spaces. Um, this is a site where we removed olives seven years ago. Um, we started work there. Um, and so this bare area here was, uh, oh sorry, just in the background there you can see the olives. So this is uh, a reserve in Onkaprenga Council and it, there's a boundary with a private property, an unfenced boundary, and that we removed olives up to their boundary. And the, the bare area there is because uh, the, the olives have been there for years and, and nothing else could grow there. So, um, But we've been spraying that and making sure that nothing comes back. So um, we went through and we marked all the native plants we could find with pin marks and weeded around those, hand weeded, and then uh, sprayed all the rest and have, have kept it weed, weed free for those seven years. And it, it's got now these areas of Michaelina are just filling in those spaces. The area back there, where, um, I brush cut that a couple of weeks ago just to stop the annual weeds. Um, I, I did plant some orchids in here, about 10 plants. But, and orchids are tricky things to, to get going because the Michaelina has filled in those spaces as well. And so um, a lot of those orchids haven't survived that competition with the Michaelina. So yeah, um, I, I was at, at a site this week where the um, other contractors have done weed control of olives and already there's cleavers and bridal creeper it's, it, and thistles. It's become a habitat for, for orchids, uh, so, so for weeds. And so... Um, Orchid control is really important to, I guess I'm, you probably already know this, but the, it, it's really important to do your weed control after controlling olives, otherwise you create a, um, more of a problem than you had before. Okay. Um, and next topic is just what the Native Orchid Society is doing that Rosalie and I have been involved with. Um, a, lot of our, a lot of effort's been involved in uh, orchid propagation of some of the rarest orchids and we've been working in, in uh, partnership with the um, South Australian Sea Bank and the Botanic Gardens and with the Orchid Conservation Centre, I think it's called, in, in uh, Royal Botanic Gardens in Victoria. And so we've been introducing um, metallic sun orchids both to South Australia and Victoria. The interesting thing is that um, funding for national parks is is insecure because of their time scale and so they only plant on private land because they can be sure that, the, that they will have continued support uh, for, for a longer period because, um, and they plant if they're going to plant orchids they will plant hundreds of plants they want to get enough plants to produce a stable self-regenerating population. Um, so, you know, basically, a performance measure of whether your re revegetation restoration is working is 
do you have stable orchids or do you have multiplying orchids and do you have uh, natural regeneration, are your shrubs and trees reproducing and filling those spaces or, or are they being just replaced by weeds? As, as a, I think that's a really important performance measure. Um, so the Orchid Society is starting to move into doing some similar things to what those um, organisations have been doing with the rarest orchids and we're hoping to be able to um, produce our more common orchids and we've, we're setting up or we've established a facility now we've got um, laminar flow cabinets uh, the, the, we've just had the electricity and the plumbing sort of sorted out in the last few weeks so we're, we're moving into that stage of being able to gem, germinate seeds <coughs> which need to be done in a sterile environment <coughs> because if you, they grow them on agars and agars will grow fungi or bacteria very readily, so we've, we've found that uh, face masks are really handy for so <laughs> reducing um, uh, contamination, uh, but it's quite a skill to be able to do that. And, um, so we've been able to do all of the steps, we've been able to germinate seeds, we've been able to replate, we've been able to take them out of the, out of the potting mix and establish them in pots. So we've proven each step. So. What we now want to do is to be able to uh, develop seed banks in uh, local areas if we can get each of the local councils involved. We'd like them to have their own seed bank or, or, or bank of native plants uh, that they can use for either collecting seed or dividing tubers off of those so that we can actually get orchids in the revegetation projects. And, and that's important not just because we get orchids out there, but it will change the way weed control is done. Because at the moment, a lot of revegetation is about planting trees and shrubs in weedy paddocks and ending up with trees and shrubs in weedy paddocks with no, no sort of planning on how do you get to a stage where, where you've got a, a useful um, understory. Because the biodiversity is in the understory. And so far, the, there's no vision for that. Um, and I've been really disappointed trying to contact, trying to speak with Green Adelaide about this. And their, their consultation process is about uh, engaging the broader community and they're not really listening to, the, to specialists. And I don't think they're listening to their own staff. Um, I think they've got a, really, a lot of really competent people in, in, um, in the department and I, I don't think they're, they're listening to those. Um, so other, um, obviously we want to get um, people growing native orchids in their own homes, in their own shade houses. It's a lot better than going out and digging up plants that they find in the wild and where the, you know, they dig them up and you know, grow for a year or two and, and then die. We, we want to pe get people learning how to do it, to realise that they are available uh, from, from the Orchid Society and that they can start off with the easier to grow ones and, and learn how to, to grow it and keep the fungi alive. And if we can get that process happening, hopefully there'd be uh, less temptation to go out and actually dig something up. And if there's more education so that people know it's really quite difficult to grow, um, that's the kind of process that we're interested in. Of course, we're also doing um, uh, monitoring Generally, with the more with the rarest orchids, some of the rarest orchids are just about counted every year. Um, some we're collecting seed from, like um, uh, Caledonia gladiolata. We've managed to um, to get seed of that growing, and I think they've been able to collect some this year, haven't they? The, well, the last year, I've certainly seen that they've got flowers. They had, we actually saw some in the. Um, some plants growing in the uh, at the botanic gardens. They had an open day um, uh, earlier this year, so it was exciting to actually see them. It was really interesting that they found that they, they thought there were two different kinds in Scott Creek and Flinders Ranges, but when they grew the seeds from uh, Scott Creek in cultivation, they found that they came up exactly like those in the, in the Flinders Ranges. So it's really interesting learning about that. And of course we have um, 
were involved in weeding. Generally, NOS's involvement in weeding is generally in partnership with other groups like Threatened Plant Action Group doing work in Belair, or there's a friends group on York Peninsula at uh, Brentwood Cemetery that uh, we've been involved with over the years, um, helping them with weeding. And yes, yeah, so I've mentioned educating the community. Right, so basically a summary of um, what I've been talking about. Orchids are survivors, they have strategies for surviving, but they're, they're also fairly precarious because they have that very narrow range of habitat requirements. And small changes in those conditions can, can wipe, them, wipe out a population. Um, the stir disturbance needs to match their lifespan. So if the, life, if the, the orchids are only living two years, well, there needs to be continual disturbance of some sort. So sometimes brushing, uh, slashing fibre rates can be good, but it has to make sure that they actually have a chance to flower. And that, that's the big problem at the moment is the, uh, the slashing regime in a lot of the national parks is just too early. And, that, and people say, oh yes, but there's still orchids there. Well, yes, but they're not reproducing, they're not producing seed. Um, as, as our conservation officer said, well, if you're going to slash them, why do you call it a conservation park? Because <laughs> that should be its purpose. Um, yeah, so uh, I think I've made that message clear that the weeds and orchids are competing for those disturbed sites. And so controlling those uh, weeds is really important. Those, those, the annual weeds, which tend to slip under the radar because we're focusing on um, woody weeds and weeds of national significance, if we let those little weeds get, get, get in, some of them are just impossible to control because they come up year after year. Um, if you've got other native plants in amongst them, then they, they're extremely time consuming to, to weed around. And particularly plants with wind grown seeds, like the, the thistles, um, cats, cat's ears, um, that have wind blown seeds, you don't want them in your area. It's worth taking that trouble to, to deal with them outside of your, your area of focus to make sure that they don't blow in. Yeah, so that, that's basically my message. If you, if you want to do revegetation re with an understory, you have to start early with the annual weeds. You can't leave them till the end. So that's a really major change that we'd like to see happen. Orchids are one of the largest plant families on Earth. There are thousands of species, and some of the rarest ones are in the far-flung corners of the globe, like Australia, where we have over 1,800 species. I'm out in some remnant bush, 45 minutes' drive from Adelaide. I'm going for a very careful walk with some orchid experts to see if we can spot some of the region's most delicate attractions. Get it? Rosalie and Robert Lawrence have shared their love of orchids for decades. It's called orchid fever. <laughs> People, you, you get bitten by the bug and that's it. They're just so exquisite, such a huge variety. Of course, they're good for taking photographs of. Very They're not like birds that fly away. They, they <laughs> stay there long enough to sort of get a good shot. So we're looking for terrestrial or ground orchids, and one of the best places to spot them is on the path, isn't it? The path has an element of some clearance, and orchids like just a little bit of disturbance. Mm -hmm. That means we can see them easily, which is mm -hmm. really good. Trampling, walking on them, that destroys them. Mm. But by having the path, we don't have to go far to see them. If we sort of start looking in here... Oh, okay. Actually, there's two. So there's one over there, and there's one here. This is a reasonably sized, very pretty orchid. It's the black fire orchid, Pyrorchis nigricans. And it's called black because it, after the flower finishes, it, it turns black. You can find this blackened remains, like it's been burnt, but wow. you can see all the features still. So you can see the, the sepals, you can see the petals, you can see the labellum, all the parts of the flower because mm. of how it just dries and mummifies. It's quite a common species. As you can see, there are 
probably lots, hundreds of thousands make that of leaves. <laughs> of leaves. So they, they spread right out and right back up there. But and that's all you see are usually mm. the leaves. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's unusual to see it in flower unless there's been a fire. I might find some orchids on this side. Right over here. Okay, so what's that so one? That's the narrow-lipped spider orchid or queen? Queen. I queen. prefer queen spider orchid for that. This one is only found in South Australia. Okay, so endemic. It's, a, it's endemic to South Australia. One of the characteristics of spider orchids is the hairy leaf and the hairy stems. And if you look at them really closely, this species has two lengths of hairs, has tiny little hairs that cover most of it, and then there are long silky hairs as well. One of the things about all orchids is that they rely on the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. They rely on it for seed germination, but the thing about the spider orchids is they actually rely on the fungi for the whole of their life cycle, which is one of the reasons why it's a very difficult orchid to cultivate. And that's why it's important that we actually look after what's here in the bush. Mm -hmm. You can't see the fungi, but seeing the orchid tells us the fungi's there. There's another um, one there. Yes. Yeah, two of them. Oh, beautiful. So they're the maroon hoods. Gorgeous. Oh, here we've got a good example of mimicry, where we've got a native pea that's in flower, mm -hmm. and then we've got over here we've got orchids, which are the, the same colour and shape, but slightly larger than the flowers of the of the peas. So a bee coming along looking for food on the, on the peas sees the orchid flowers and thinks, oh, they're brighter and bigger, let's go to them first. And so the, all the orchids are strategically placed around the shrubs, so they're in an ideal place to get fertilised by the native bees. Nature is awesome, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> now, native orchids are like an indicator of ecosystem change, aren't they? So their health yeah. mm. is like the the warning for us yes. yes yes that's right they don't exist by themselves they they need a functioning ecosystem for their whole life cycle to be completed for some of them we don't know which insects pollinate them and for some we no longer know what pollinated them in the past it seems that, that some of the pollinators have disappeared because some are not being pollinated Despite decades of careful observation by enthusiasts, in some ways, orchids remain mysterious. Robert and Rosalie have teamed up with the University of Adelaide to create an app that lets orchid enthusiasts record data and share it with scientists. Katie Irvine is one of the ecologists working on the project. So orchid enthusiasts are very passionate, aren't they? They are. We have an amazing group of orchid enthusiasts around the country who are taking beautiful photographs of orchids, who have amazing skills and knowledge when it comes to orchid identification. And the Wild Orchid Watch app is going to be able to be a hub for these people to be able to put all of their information in one place and then scientists will have access to that data. So how does it work? Uh, you can take your orchid photos via the app, mm -hmm. have your location services turned on on your phone so then we can map where the orchids are around Australia and then we'll just have a series of questions, quite simple questions that the ecologists have set up for us so that we have really great quality data. And once all this information is gathered, what's the purpose? So we know that orchids are an indicator of ecosystem change. They are a really vital part of the ecosystem, but they do tend to disappear quite quickly when there's been disturbance at a site. So it's very important that we can map where orchids are, the 1800 species that we have in Australia. And then that information can be used obviously for publishing um, by researchers, but also for land managers and people who maybe are looking at things like development approvals and that kind of thing. There's always the joy of discovering native orchids and sharing your findings is half the fun. 
That's why there are so many orchid clubs and societies around Australia. But if people can pool their resources and share their findings more broadly, we can better understand these beautiful plants and better protect them. Of course, that's from the ABC uh, Gardening Show website. Um, just to acknowledge that. Yeah. Because that was a whole day's work, those seven minutes. <laughs> um, we, um, they were going to give us six minutes, so I thought, well, that was good. We've got about seven and a half or something. So, <laughs> and uh, we left at five o'clock, I think it was, and they were still filming the, the last bits with Katie and. Um, um, Sophie was sort of almost in dark conditions. They had the lights on for that. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, a, it was a long day. That little bit where the, I talk about the mimicry, um, that was the third take for that. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. Yeah, yeah so any questions? What, yes. What kind of fungi are we talking about uh, supporting the culture? Um, Any ideas? Or? They have names, but they, they don't have uh, fruiting bodies that uh, you can sort of see at the surface, or at least most of them don't. They um, presumably leave spores on pieces of wood where they, where they finish, or, or they actually rely on the, the orchids themselves to provide um, a refuge during the summer so that they, uh, when the when the rains come, they sort of uh, disperse from the orchid themselves. So it seems that the fungi don't actually get any benefit, any nutritional benefit from the orchids themselves. So it's, it's purely one way, but in terms of um, providing them a secure place to, to survive the summer, they seem to, you know, that's, that's, that's the current theory that that's the benefit they get out of it. So collectively, they're called mycorrhizal fungi. And there are several species. They have not isolated all of them. There's a lot of research being done into that. And some orchids, um, or one recent research found that um, Crassophyllums, one species of Crassophyllum, relied upon seven species of fungi. Hmm. We haven't got that on cultivation yet. <laughs> so it's quite complex. And, and at different uh, stages of their their life cycle, so they have one that germinates the seeds and uh, another one that sort of takes them on. And so, well, there's a partnership between them. You know, that so it's not, not simple at all. Are there any orchids that don't rely on fungi? Um, um, you, can, no. okay. you can grow them um, once, with a, once, <laughs> once you've got a tuber, you can grow some of them in a potting mix without any problem. But uh, yeah, they have to, because those seeds are so tiny, uh, you either need to grow them in an agar or, or to have fungi to get them um, up and established so that they form a protocorn and then um, and the fungi even help through, through that whole process because of, there's no photosynthesis during that early stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. You mentioned wasps several times, native bees once and honeybees not at all. What's the uh, and ants one. Sorry? And ants. No, oh, ants, yes. <laughs> um, what's your feeling with uh, the importance of native bees, which are under extreme pressure at the moment throughout the country? Well, they certainly. Yeah, um, yeah, for certain species, they are really crucial. Um, some of the sun orchids um, probably, glossodias probably also rely on them. Of course, the European bees don't help at all. They don't visit them, um, they have no capacity to sort of... Uh, so that's why you didn't mention the honeybees? No, they, don't, they tend to chew the plant yeah. more rather than collect the There seem to be equal numbers. You're saying there's 1,800 species of orchids in Australia. Apparently there's over 1,700 different species of native bees. Mm -hmm. You've almost got a one to one, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, yeah, I don't know what proportion would be pollinated by bees. Yeah. I'm thinking like or something like that. It's the bigger ones, the, um, the sun orchids are the most common ones. And, and, and the diurus. And the diurus. 
um, and a lot of them we don't know. So pres presumably the buyer output would be native B, I, I guess. But some of them we just haven't haven't got any information. There are people who are dedicated to getting up and watching uh, an orchid all day to see whether anything pollinates. Mm -hmm. and, and like that, uh, the copper beardy, we had somebody who went out every day and said, oh, we, we saw one wasp over a two week period. <laughs> <laughs> so you're relying on that very small number of, of insects to try and, you know, a, a plant, we've only got 20 plants, so uh, they did some hand pollination. I think I want to see whether how that compared with, with uh, just leaving it for the bees to pollinate, or for the wasps to pollinate. I noticed that you, in the video, there was some pictures of the wild mm -hmm. orchid watch cards, and I know I've collected them in the past, but I destroy them very quickly. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd brought some this evening that we could share with people, or, we, or not, we, or you've run out. No, oh, I, right. I gave them to someone to take to a science event, and I haven't got them back from oh, it. Oh, no. Yes. Okay. And yes. we've made them a little bit more plastic, mm. so that they will last longer. Fabulous. Well, when you do get some back, can we inquire? Uh, do people want a copy of the little, if they see the little card? That, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're all nodding. We, we could have just a little bundle. And we'll, yeah, all right, yeah, we can arrange that. that. Thank you. We sometimes see them on other sites or on Facebook. People put them next to all sorts. I put them all next to yes, I have to admit I'm guilty. So, so that's all right. Because if it's something so small, use, yeah. and that's right, and you're putting it on the naturalist, well, we, it's very handy. Yeah, we had somebody inquire just this week where they, uh, I saw, I found the Facebook page where they said, "Oh, where do you get those cards from?" <laughs> so it's obviously um, promoting the project, which is part of the, part of the goal. So, is this app just for Android? No, no. Mm. It's, it's a web. It's, I couldn't find it. No, no, you won't find it in Play Store because yeah. it's a, what they call a progressive web application right. as opposed to native application. Okay. So Play Store has all your native apps, but this one's on the web site. So right. you actually have to go to the Wild Orchid Watch website to okay. find it. Right. So the card, I do have one with me because I always carry one. The card will actually have a QR code on the back which will take you straight to the app. But if you go to the website, you'll also get that as well. Yeah. But you do need to upload iNaturalist um, to get started, yeah. to log in, to, develop, to put in your own username and things like that. And Because you do need to log into it to, to edit it. So yeah, you need to join up. We can give separate things, talks now on, on just the app alone. And there are webs there are videos on the videos on, on the, the WoW website as well. Yeah. 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 Lovely. Does anyone else have any more questions? Well thank you all for staying so late. Things up for a little bit, but um, other than that, I think that sort of ends our formal proceedings. But uh, you know, normal. Action.